on how it works. First, just to understand what we really do, what TEOS, the token economy operating system, is about. The first thing is, you might not see it, so we have four pillars. The first one is documentation, very important, you want to know what you get, right? Then tokenization, for most people a no-brainer, but we put a lot of added values in there, it's not just running a smart contract, it's more. Compliance, it's becoming even, let's say, more pressing since the new FATF rules have been published. And then, of course, the trading. So, um, documentation. Documentation is more than just read the fucking white paper, because that was it in the last years. Um, people created a token, put it to the market and said, well, if you want to know what you get, look at the website, look at the white paper, that's it. What we do is more. So we allow an intrinsic documentation, which is timestamped and hashed on the blockchain. We can add more data, like for example, what's the jurisdiction, what's the unit of measure. Um, we have parameters like token unit fraction, which allows us to cater for increasing or decreasing interests, fees, storage costs. There are some details. Imagine, for example, you put um, some, some assets somewhere or you have cattle that is the asset and you want to document um, what is the right the token holder will get. For example, a share of the turnover of the cattle farm or whatever it might be. And somehow an investor needs to know what is he actually getting. And all that, the number of cattle, um, their health status, some certification, whatever, all that can be added as a piece of information to the token, which is really an innovation. We have things like amendments and we can add attachments thanks to the technology of Ambitorio. So we power Ambitorio, Ambitorio powers us, right? So um, asset reports, amendment, uh, um, assessments, um, audit reports, they can attach, be attached to a token. Second thing is uh, the tokenization itself. So mostly people have been used to just download a copy of um, an uh, open Zeppelin contract, then adjust it, like give it a new token, um, no, what's it called, token ticker or whatever, and some description and that's it, just, just launch. And uh, it's more than that. So first of all, it's not an individual contract, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. It's basically an entry in a large database on blockchain. And um, the process is without any coding at all, it doesn't need an audit, it's already audited for you. It has some additional values instead of what you normally used to have like um, some kind of decimal numbers. We changed, it's basically a new concept. We have a unit of measure. Most contracts, they just don't know a unit of measure. Normally you have a number of tokens, that's it. So it's a counter, but nothing more. But with um, um, the capability of the document DB, so the documentation feature, you can count your tokens in kilograms or ounces or kilograms of meat, right? Um, liters, I don't know, how many units do we have? Like 140 or something, all SI units. I think even, what was the cu most curious ones? Uh, candela, right? That's the, the unit of, of light and all that, that stuff. So you can use units of measure. And uh, that unit can have a decreasing a parameter or an increasing parameter. You can adjust for interest rates or storage costs. Only few people actually thought about the problem when you store real assets for somebody. And the token grants that somebody the right to come later, like in a year or two or 10, and claim the real asset. In the meantime, you accrue storage costs, right? And who pays for the storage cost? And that's um, that was an elemental question which was asked to us by um, a partner, an early partner, yeah, well, who is paying the storage cost? I have it. So when I store real assets, I generate an additional cost for me for, I don't know, um, several hundred uh, US dollars per year, per ton of asset. Who pays for that? The one who gets it the first, the token, or the one who finally claims the asset? Both is unfair, right? And we have a model which allows to uh, to put that cost on the token holder at the time when he holds the token. 
that is more advanced than, for example, the rollover of a bond. I can show you in detail later. It's a complex concept. I just want to say we have a solution for that. And um, compliance? Yes, compliance, important. Um, we have heard about it uh, many times. And the easiest solution actually was to try to get the token defined as a utility token. Why? Because then you got around the necessity to do KYC for each individual sale and so forth. So um, utility token was the way to go. But that's not what it's going to be in the future. So you can't make every token a utility token. So intrinsically, people know sooner or later you have to do all that compliance stuff yourself. And compliance really means knowing the origin, where a token comes from, and being able to control where it goes to. And we can do that. There is a facility which we call controller. The controller comes in its standard configuration with a whitelist and a blacklist. The whitelist, it's basically a list of Ethereum addresses, but the one who controls, who controls the controller, who administers the controller, knows to which names those addresses belong to. So he does KYC. And a whitelist entry means that address is allowed to hold and to get that token. For example, you can use it for um, a shareholder uh, agreement. Only shareholders, existing shareholders, are allowed to purchase those tokens, nobody from outside. That can be realized with a whitelist. A blacklist, on the opposite, allows to cater for some events like a stolen private key or a lost private key or whatever. So you don't have access to the tokens anymore. They are still there, but you don't have access to it. So what do you do? You just put the old address on a blacklist, generate the tokens from, from scratch, and issue the tokens again to the original holder, a new address, of course, which is whitelisted. This essentially leads to a frozen number of tokens, but that's not a problem, right? It's stolen anyway. So that's a very good, pragmatic, and straightforward solution. For anything else, you can define any kind of rule set you want. For this, you can use a custom controller. Also there. No details, details in personal talk later when you're interested. And then the final part is actually the trading itself. That was where we started. Now it's the last thing which I explain, simply because it's, um, it needs some focus. Think about the problem which we have today with stable coins. At the moment, everybody thinks that the holy grail of token is the stable coin. So there are a couple of companies already trying to, well, establish their Swiss franc stable coin in the Swiss economy or, and beyond. And there are already a couple of US dollar stable coins and so forth. There are many, but they all claim to have the same backing, the same type of backing, but never the same pile of asset. You get what I want to say? If you have two different issues of the same asset, you have a blue, uh, yeah, blue US dollar and a green US dollar, then these two US dollars, they are essentially different because they have different issues. They have different stockpiles. If I am the holder of a green US dollar token and I go to the issuer of the uh, blue US dollar token and say, hey, can I have the real asset? You can imagine what he will say, right? He will say, no, <laughs> go to the guy with the green, go to the green issuer simply because if I give you something from my stockpile, I diminish my backing and I just get a green dollar token. That's not, I'm not the issue, full stop. <laughs> Go to the issue of your green dollar token. So those things are not the same. And uh, it leads to a situation like uh, the, what's it called, the ba Babylonian uh, language problem. Like we have, we talk about the same asset, but um, due to different issues, they are different. So we don't talk the same thing, the same language. Situation here, I want to buy a Bitcoin, for example, Bitcoin token, and I want to buy it for the green US dollar token. Problem, the one who offers the, the Bitcoin token says, nope, I'm selling it against the blue US dollar token. What's the most logical thing to do? I have to exchange first, right? So first I need to find somebody who exchange my green US dollar token into a blue US dollar token. Then I go to the guy with the Bitcoin token and say, hey, now you can have it. And what we realized is a combination of those offers 
into a single trading sequence. We call it warp. We couldn't trademark it, unfortunately, because it was already trademarked. Nonetheless, warp is a good name for it. Um, and by combining it into such a trade sequence and running it in one single transaction, it's transaction safe. For me as a customer, I am able now to buy for a green US dollar token, the Bitcoin, even though it has never been offered against the green US dollar token. What CoreLedger does is uh, it's a big database of, uh, of offers. We call them supplies. And we have a search engine which searches paths through all those offers and combines them to the desired trading sequence. And the user executes those trading sequences. And um, what it what, what results is, in essence, a decentralized marketplace. So a decentralized exchange without offering that on the market like, um, like we being the ones who run it. So it runs on itself on the basis of smart contracts. Speaking of that, what is Theos now? So Theos is the combination of all those four features which I mentioned. And it's an infrastructure combining various uh, APIs, of course. It has smart contracts and has protocols and the idea, the underlying idea, is to make the digital transformation simple and easy. And that's what we have done for these three projects already. So they run on the API layer. And, uh, well, future will tell how successful they are. Tuesday next week, there will be the go live of SmartMo. You can witness that in uh, Luzern, so the, the hardware is already installed. So that's our second rollout, actually. Ambitoria will come a little bit later. So the question, how you can use Tails? Well, you can use it on a UI label, uh, layer. So we have a white-labeled marketplace, which allows to access all those features, which I already mentioned. To document things, create your own asset and asset tokens, trade those tokens, put a compliance controller on it, and Make sure that only those people you want to trade your token have access to it. So um, there we have already uh, three partners running on it. Then you can use it from the API layer. This is exactly what um, SmartMo is doing, Ambitorio and BD300, the game which was uh, published in, in April. Then um, you can use it in the form of an ERC20 token. That's um, kind of primitive now, but it's possible. So you simply attach a so-called proxy contract. Also, there are technical details I'm happy to explain later. And <laughs> the last layer is, of course, the smart contract layer. There, <laughs> our marketing refused to put the, the picture of myself in because I'm, <laughs> I'm always using uh, Theos from the smart contract layer because I don't need the UI, essentially. So yeah, this is how Theos can be used and how the features can be used. Good. How does Theos look? Well, how does the white label marketplace look? Because I can hardly show you, okay, I can, but um, I think it's a bit, a bit awkward. I can show you the code, but you are not interested in code, right? So what I can show you is the white labeled marketplace itself, and I will demonstrate it live if you're interested. Um, it's a UI, which has an overview, might be a little bit small, so from the backside you see nice colors, right? It has nice colors and blobs and rectangles, <laughs> whatever. So. Uh, it's a UI which allows you to tokenize, trade, and that's it. I show you in a live demo.